Welcome to Brussels Forum 2020. We are pleased to introduce the president of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, Dr. Karen Donfried. Welcome to the 15th Brussels Forum. I have been so looking forward to celebrating the forum's 15th anniversary together with you in person in Brussels. But in light of the pandemic, we have transformed Brussels Forum from a two-day conference to a month-long global online event. I was part of the first forum and owe a shout out to my predecessor, Craig Kennedy, who inspired Brussels Forum and to Ron Asmus, who was synonymous with Brussels Forum in those early years and left us far too soon. And to all of you who are joining us, thank you. This is a singular and sobering time. At GMF, we believe that the two sides of the Atlantic are stronger when they are working together in pursuit of common goals joined by shared values. Today, we seem ever more divided. As I sit here in Washington, DC, COVID-19 has killed over 100,000 Americans, 40 million Americans have lost their jobs, political polarization is deepening, and we are experiencing massive civil unrest sparked by the killing of George Floyd by a police officer in Minneapolis last week. It certainly feels like my own country, the United States, is facing a perilous moment. Our goal is for Brussels Forum to help put a spotlight on many aspects of this crisis, from the challenges facing cities to America's role in the world. GMF was created nearly 50 years ago to commemorate those who showed courage and foresight to help forge a better future after a period of profound global trauma, with the hope that future generations would use their example as inspiration to meet their own challenges. This is one of those moments. I know that my opening conversation with Washington Post columnist David Ignatius and former European Commissioner Cecilia Malmstrom will inspire us. Before we begin that conversation, I would like to thank our partners. Our founding partners, Daimler and the Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, thank you for 15 wonderful years. To our forum partner, Deloitte, and to all of our associate supporting and knowledge partners, without whom Brussels Forum would not be possible. For those of you who are listening, please send in your questions on Twitter using the GMF handle at Gumfus, G-M-F-U-S, or you can use the hashtag Brussels Forum. Alternatively, you can shoot us an email, brusselsforum at gmfus.org. And I will make sure to weave your questions into my conversation with David Ignatius and Cecilia Malmstrom, and later on with the US Coronavirus Response Coordinator, Ambassador Deborah Burks. So with that, I'd like to bring in David and Cecilia and have them help me set the context for the conversations we're going to have over the coming month. As I mentioned, David is a columnist at the Washington Post. Cecilia has held many positions, including two times as European Commissioner, most recently European Commissioner for Trade. David and Cecilia, as I've been thinking about the many uncertainties facing the future of transatlantic relations, two of the big uncertainties, it seems to me, are how we manage the pandemic and then what the outcome of the US presidential election in November will be. And there is surely an interaction between those two things as well. Cecilia, let me start with you. When you think about the implications of the pandemic, there are lots of theories out there. Some are arguing it will be like a passing storm. It'll do a lot of damage, but then move on and will recover relatively quickly. Other people say, no, no, no. This pandemic is like an earthquake that is shaking the global power structure, not to mention having an outsized impact on our societies. There's another theory that says the pandemic is an accelerator 
of existing trends. From where you sit, what do you think? Well, first of all, good morning to our American friends and good afternoon to our European friends. It's an honor to be here to celebrate the 50th, 15th anniversary of um, being in Europe, at least. Well, I think the pandemic, it's so hard to say because we don't know if we are at the end of it or in the beginning of it or in the midst of it. We could have a second wave coming in a couple of weeks or months. And then, of course, all the, the measures that we have taken to, to start exiting from, from the crisis will be thrown back and we'll have to start all over again. I think it will change the world, whatever happens. And we've already seen that it has accelerated the, the um, weakening of international organizations. Where is the UN? G20 has been basically silent. Uh, there is a lack of American Chinese and European leadership in this as well. And the international organizations such as WHO has also been quite uh, silent. Uh, it will affect us because millions of people will come out of, of jobs. They will not be able to go back immediately. We will have companies getting bankrupt. We will have um, value chains interrupted, relocalized. Protectionism is already uh, growing and all that will have an effect and that underlines the, the acute need of transatlantic cooperation uh, to, to see how can we together take the good things that is actually coming out of this uh, uh, as well. I mean, new ways of, of cooperating and new opportunities to reform uh, our relationship and the international organizations. Uh, but I don't really see that happening uh, right now and that, that pains me uh, a lot. But, but it will be a long time before we're out of this crisis. It will affect us, but I don't think it's, it's an earthquake. Uh, we will come back. Part of it will be, be normal in a while. The question is when. Thank you, Cecilia. David, how does it look from where you sit? Well, I think this is a time, as you said, Karen, of great uncertainty. It, it's a moment when uh, gatherings like this even though we're online, uh, not face-to-face, uh, -face, I think are especially valuable. I think back uh, in time before I was born to the years in which the Marshall Plan, in which we commemorate with the German Marshall Fund, which the German government was kind enough to, to commemorate uh, with, with a memorial. That was a time of profound uncertainty, really, uh, beyond even what we're experiencing now after this massive war and loss of life. The difference then was that there was a single, strong, confident country uh, framed by allies uh, who shared common values and, and commitments that set about to rebuild an uncertain world, to provide certainty. Political institutions in Europe were, were rocking civil unrest was uh, beyond even what we're seeing in the streets of America these days. But, but there was this decisive um, uh, great power with, with big ideas and a generous heart that worked with Europe. I think today of the spirit of transatlantic cooperation that GMF, uh, which I'm a trustee, uh, and the Brussels Forum, which is our annual signature event, uh, symbolize. And that, that transatlantic relationship, I hope, will be flowing uh, east to west some in this period where the United States really is struggling. I don't have to tell the audience here, this is a difficult time for the U.S. So the, the help, uh, support, support uh, commitment to shared values of our transatlantic partners is part of what will keep us moving forward. Just to conclude, uh, as uh, like Cecilia, I think that uh, on the uh, limited question of finding a cure for the pandemic, that's in the matter. That's a matter in the hands of scientists and doctors. Uh, at some point over the next, I'm just going to pause it. Over the next year, we'll have a, a vaccine uh, that will 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 be efficacious. In the meantime, there are new therapies that are being tried um, and. The people in the medical world tell me that this really is quite an extraordinary mobilization, what you'd want to see from our advanced, prosperous countries. And we're seeing in Europe and the United States, 
the, the attempt to bring people back to work, to get our economy up and running again, that's going to be uh, uneven fits and starts. But I, I was encouraged that German uh, auto companies several weeks ago began producing cars again, calling workers into the factories. That doesn't seem to have any had any major negative uh, uh, consequences. We'll be moving toward that that phase more slow, slowly in the U.S. But uh, Therapies will resolve uh, the, the health uh, questions. The, the deeper questions of what underlie this crisis, as I think we all know, go to the very uh, way in which our societies uh, are organized. There's been deep dissatisfaction in Europe, uh, as in the United States, about the way in which the rewards of our wonderful system are distributed. We need to think about that. I think I just conclude, Karen, by saying that we need to, to make a commitment to ourselves uh, and to the institutions we work with that the world that's rebuilt after this period of pandemic and social crisis will be a better and stronger one. That's the commitment that the Marshall Plan embodied in 1947. That's really why the course of history in Europe was shaped the way it was. We need to take heart from that and, uh, and in our way, do something that's uh, similar in terms of its values. Thank you, David. And David, let me just stay with you for a minute because you put very squarely the issue of U.S. leadership on the table in reminding us of what's shaped and animated the transatlantic relationship in this post-war period. And I'd like to ask you to connect this one uncertainty of the pandemic to the other uncertainty of what's going to happen in the U.S. presidential election this fall. There are lots of things that Americans are going to be voting on when they go to the polls in November, but surely one implication of that election will be about the U.S. role in the world. So can you help us think through how the uncertainty around U.S. leadership plays into this and what your expectations there are. Thank you. Well, let me just list a couple of the issues that I'm focused on most as a journalist writing about our, our American politics and the, the factors that will shape voters as they head to the polls in, in November. A, f a fundamental need, um, you know, the paramount human need is for safety. And America is a country that's frightened now, frightened about the prospect of disease. Um, it's very interesting when you look at the poll numbers, they show all sorts of things. But one thing they pretty clearly show is that voters over 65 who are most vulnerable to COVID-19 are moving away from President Trump. They just don't feel safe. And that leads me to a larger question, whether this election, uh, when we're in a mine where we really value the expertise that our Dr. Fauci, who leads our, our struggle against infectious disease, Dr. Burks is going to be on in a few minutes. These two are voices of science, knowledge, and reason, and there's a hunger in the country to see them. When they're not on TV for a while, people get anxious. They want to see the doctors uh, and hear their voices. So maybe uh, we're going to see the fever of populism, the mistrust of experts, break some. I, we won't have a transformation. The people will know the value of, of good science, of, of fact-based uh, medicine. The final point that I'd make, Karen, is, uh, again, um, one of your uncertainties. But President Trump, like many European leaders, is a product of a re revived nationalism. We went through a period of globalization that left many ordinary people feeling that, that they've been left out of a, a process that had benefited the elites uh, disproportionately. Uh, and that's still going to be a, a driver in our politics. Uh, we're seeing on our streets that uh, African Americans feel deeply disenfranchised by the system they feel is run by the elites. The police uh, embody authority and use power irresponsibly. There's there's so many different versions of this dissatisfaction, um, and so I think. Uh, in each country, but certainly in the United States, the election outcome will be shaped by the quality of uh, the debate and the leadership. If, if a Democrat can voice in a clear, convincing way an alternative path, 
that takes people away from, from, from what we're living through now, that's going to be very powerful. If that candidate can't, I think President Trump's already preparing to you know, make a, a strong, full-throated nationalistic appeal. He, he called just recently on General Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, to, to, to be with him and making preparations that was concerning um, especially to me. So I, I, I think our election provides reasons for, for some hope that the American people will come back to a steadier appreciation of expertise, uh, good medical judgment, but also some continuing causes for free. Thank you, David. <laughs> so I'm gonna to come to you. I just wanna say, I see questions coming in, which is great, but I'm just gonna remind our viewers that you can send in those questions on Twitter using the GMF handle at GMFUS. You can use the hashtag Brussels Forum, or you can email them to Brussels Forum at GMFUS.org. So Cecilia, I want to bring you in on this conversation about where you see leadership coming from. Do you see leadership coming from the US? Are you hopeful about that in future? And is what's happening in the U.S. today, roots of systemic racism, the police violence, is that undercutting American soft power and diplomatic class abroad? And what do you see as the foreign policy knock-on effects of what's happening in the U.S.? And then, you know, if you have these concerns about the U.S., where do you see leadership coming from? And could Europe be a source of global leadership? So Cecilia, over to you. Well, thank you. Well, I think the lack of leadership today globally is, is a big problem, especially now when, when we need it uh, the most. There are individual leaders in individual countries who have handled the crisis very well and who got their, their citizen support for that. But overall, I think that there is a disappointment. Uh, what's happening right now in the US after the, the, the death of, of Mr. Floyd and, and so on. This is of course very tragic and we are following this with concern and, and wary, but that, that is something that, you know, it has happened before in the US. So it adds to the actual crisis. Um, there is a, a disappointment, I think, that the US have not chosen to show more global leadership also before the crisis. It seems as if the White House has the impression that cooperation, alliances, and you know, togetherness is, is a sign of weakness. And that's, that is a very strange feeling for Europeans who have relied on, Europe, on American leadership, on our transatlantic alliance since the Second World War, building up the global order in which we actually still live and the international organizations. Uh, so that has left a void that, that is a little bit hard to orient itself because the EU is, is, is created in a world that is kind of predictable. And when this is not predictable anymore, it becomes difficult to orient yourself. And then you have China trying to fill the, the, um, the, the vacuum of leadership, clearly trying to fill feel that, that leadership. But of course, with all the, the problems that they still have and they seem to um, add to, to the list uh, a lot as well, not only Hong Kong and Taiwan and their internal handling of, of Corona and the, the sort of propaganda machinery around that. Uh, but also you have the, the, the Chinese Sea, you have the, 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 an increased conflict right now with, with India. I mean, it seems to be adding um, a lot of, of, uh, of conflicts there. Uh, and uh, there is a disappointment in the world on, on how China has, has handled this uh, as well. Europe is of course uh, very weak in this uh, situation and the, the, the first weeks of the Corona crisis was not a beautiful moment for, for European integration. Every country went on their own, closed borders and, and did their own strategies. Um, and that can be criticized, but you have to remember that the European Union as institutions do not have legal competences over uh, health matters. So it is a national issue but I think the commission the current commission you know recovered quite quick and now have taken a lot of measures and really tried to show leadership vis-a-vis -vis the member states on immediate action both when it comes to, to smoothing the, the economic effects but also on coordinating the, the exit strategies the opening of the borders etc and also planning for the long-term future but so maybe 
as as it it goes by it can take a, a greater role but the european union needs to act in in alliances in in cooperation in friendship with, with others and and right now there are plenty of countries out there of course with whom you can and we do cooperate uh, but without a strong transatlantic link on getting out of this crisis i, I think this is um, you know this is a unique situation and the, the there is a the the the, the um, transatlantic link is is weaker than it has been maybe in a very very long time and and that's a cause of um, of worries and a little bit of confusion as well and we would need it yeah david i'd, I'd like to bring you in on this question of who is filling this global power vacuum? I mean, do we see China effectively taking advantage of this moment? Or would you say that instead of having a G2, there was some speculation about the US and China managing the world, are we seeing a G0? What's your sense of global order? Karen, I think the Chinese certainly would like to take advantage of the moment. They see the United States as a great power in retreat. Um, uh, by, by design, that was really President Trump's campaign argument, that he wanted to pull back from foreign entanglements, focus on making America great again, and the Chinese saw the opportunity to jump into a relative uh, vacuum as the president pulled back from uh, the TTP trade alliance uh, in, in Asia Pacific, uh, pulled back from nego negotiation with Europe of the so-called TTIP. Um, it, it's interesting that the Chinese are, are having some trouble making this soft power bid for soft hegemony work. Uh, my colleague, Graham Allison at the Harvard Kennedy School and I have been thinking about how you put together a net assessment, uh, as the Pentagon likes to say, of the United States and China after the pandemic. Net assessment is a concept that uh, Pentagon uh, officials developed to think about how uh, the Soviet Union and the U.S. would emerge after a nuclear war. Well, this isn't a nuclear war, but it's it's a major disruption. So if we make a net assessment going forward, we obviously see some strengths for China, China's soft glove authoritarian police state. It can manage... Um, uh, reaction to a pandemic, uh, it can manage quarantine, uh, movement of people, prevention of movement of people in a way that uh, freer societies can't. But we also have seen the extraordinary uh, drawbacks of a, of a system that suppresses and manipulates information. Chinese people, we know, are really upset that the doctors who first saw this uh, pandemic developing in Wuhan were arrested and punished for trying to spread the news, spread the warning. Uh, I've written a good deal about uh, the doctors who tried to suggest maybe this wasn't an accident in nature, but some accidental leak from a laboratory in Wuhan. We, we don't really know. Uh, the, those papers were initially published in China and then su suppressed in, in February. So I think China um, has illustrated the strengths and weaknesses of its system. And you'd say the same thing for the United States with the disarray at the federal level in our national government has been sometimes catastrophic, but at the state government level in our federalist system, many states have responded well to great difficulty. Governors and mayors have done a, a good job. So our system, we tend to forget, isn't just what happens in Washington, but it's this dispersed process. And it's a little bit like Cecilia says, at the, at the, at the coordinated central level, our union has has been has been weaker than we'd hoped, but but at the at the at the edges of in the individual units, uh, we're seeing a lot of strength and, and resilience. So uh, I think uh, China and the United States moving forward uh, are going to be in a long term competition. Any question that people had before the pandemic, I think, is now resolved. And, and one question I think for Cecilia and for all of my European friends is. How does Europe uh, see itself playing in that 
um, world of, of deepening co uh, competition, I won't say confrontation with China. There's some concern in, in the US, not simply in the Trump administration, that Europe may try to hedge its bets by playing the two off, uh, trying to play a bridging role. And I, I think that, that would, would cause people here concern uh, it would seem uh, perhaps like an opportunistic strategy by, by Europe. But I think that's one of the, th I'm sure that Europe, Europe as a whole, the individual countries haven't decided yet how they want to live in this post pandemic world. Um, but I think those are the questions that, that we should help uh, GMF uh, talk about, help people th think through carefully because they'll be very consequential. Cecilia, I think that was actually a question directed at you about how Europe manages this. Does Europe try to bridge the divide between the US and China? Does Europe need to choose one of these? What would be your response to that? Well, I think Europe wants to be, to avoid to be pushed into a situation where it has to choose. If it has to choose between the American way, the, 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 the values, democracy, openness, of course, Europe and US are in the same camp. I mean, China is an authoritarian system with a, an increasingly uh, problems when it com comes to, to human rights with a quite aggressive investment strategy with its um, promotion of an alternative way of life that, that it promotes through Belt and Road in Africa and other countries that we are deeply uncomfortable with. Uh, we see many of the concerns of how China is reacting, dumping markets over um, um, subsidizing companies, state-owned companies in a way that, that erodes competition. With all that, I mean, we share the American criticism, but we don't share the, the, the methods. We don't think trade war is a good way to, to, to address it. Rather, cooperation with US and, and uh, Europe and other strong economies as well in order to try to push uh, China and to engage more of, of a dialogue. I mean, Europe, is uh, obviously wants to engage also with, with China, not being naive, but also, engage, I mean, trading with China, cooperating with China, trying to find areas where we need to act together, I mean, climate change and a few uh, other issues. But, but with the sort of um, political last development where, where many European politicians feel that the door has been slammed from, from Washington side, there is a lack of trust and that leads to not automatically signing up to what whatever U.S. says on, on, on China. But US, Europe has been divided on this as well and still is to a certain extent. But last year there was a joint publication on a sort of first uh, strategy vis-a-vis -vis China where it says that China is a partner but it is also a systemic rival. Uh, and that was the first time the European Union expressed something unanimously, which kind of at least put uh, quite strong criticism that was would not have been possible three or four years ago. And Cecilia, I want to bring in one of the questions because it follows up on this. One of our listeners is pointing out that Germany will be taking over the presidency of the European Union in July and has planned a summit with Xi mm -hmm. in Leipzig. And they're curious how you think that will play out and whether a more unified Europe would stand up and defend these values that we hold so dear around rule of law, democracy, and respect for human dignity. What are your thoughts about that EU-China summit? Well, I, I would hope that that would be a moment if the summit takes place. It's still not certain because of the, the pandemic, of course, whether it's really going to take place in Leipzig as planned, but, but at least it could be on a virtual basis. And the plan was to announce a few areas of cooperation and a conclusion, or at least a political conclusion of the investment agreement that we've been negotiating with China for, for a long time. Uh, so that is one part of it, but there is also an increasing concern for what's happening in the tightening of, of the, or the, the, uh, the, the new laws in Hong Kong, for instance, which is of, of great concern, and also the way China uh, has handled some, some parts of, of the pandemic, not in the, as, as David said, the, the, the doctors and the whistleblowers disappearing, but also now with the quite aggressive propaganda uh, when it comes to possibly criticizing China on, on how it's handled. So, so there is a, a wariness and awareness of some of the, the 
very aggressive investments vis-a-vis -vis critical European infrastructure as well. But at the same time, and we have to be honest about this, there is also dependence on China. China is a very important trading and economic uh, partner, and especially for Germany. So, so they will have to navigate and try to find a, a balance there. But if there is a possibility that the summit can be be held, it, it will take place. This is very important for the German presidency. And it could be an important, it's always better to talk. Uh, that's the European way that, than to slam doors and to have trade wars. And David, another one of our viewers is concerned about the fact that what this viewer is calling the West seems so much weaker and less influential at this moment in history. And, you know, David, I wanted to draw you out on how you see China using to its advantage the divisions, the civil unrest in the United States, divisions in Europe. And what does that mean for whether democracy looks like a system that delivers for its citizen or whether autocrats are getting stronger at this moment in history? What would you say? So oh, I, I think it's a great question. Uh, in a sense, uh, the, the Chinese couldn't uh, dream of a, of a better moment to present what, you know, in many ways, is a, is a weak case for a party-controlled, top-down, authoritarian system of government. But compared to what seems the, the chaotic uh, America that isn't a global leader, that isn't doing very well coordinating its national resources to fight the pandemic, a, a country whose social cohesion in the most uh, basic sense seems uh, so, so frayed, uh, it's almost sometimes like a cartoon image to support the Chinese argument, we have a better way. Give up some of your freedom, your democratic uh, opportunities, they only lead to chaos. Uh, let the wise leaders like the ones you see in China um, take the lead. So th that's the case that they're making. Um, they certainly have a lot of mistakes in the American record over the last 15, 20 years to point to, to say, that this is not a reliable superpower. That said, let me just m make the, the obvious caveat. When I look at the fundamentals uh, beyond the images that we're seeing uh, every day in this, in this crisis, there are a couple that we forget, but, but they're central. One is the global financial system. We may be in a period of deglobalization to some extent on trade, but I'm not convinced of that. And Cecilia would be the expert who could speak to, to that. Um, supply chains still seem pretty global and pretty robust. But in the financial world, uh, we are an ever more integrated global economy. And the, the, there is unquestioned primacy in that economy of the United States. The Federal Reserve, led, led by Jay Powell, has, has been a steady, solid um, guard, guardian of financial stability. Um, Jay Powell and the Fed are working uh, well with the European Central Bank, Christine Lagarde, well known to us in Washington. Uh, they're working well with all of the Bank of International Settlements, uh, Basel groups in which the central bankers run this global economy. Back in March, as Cecilia knows, there were real concerns about liquidity problems, real freeze up of markets that would be reminiscent of 2008 uh, and the, the worst of, of the Great Recession markets seeming they were almost ready to lock up. That didn't happen because of good American leadership and the world knows it. They know right where that, 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 that good sense uh, came from. And finally, in the, in the sphere of military power and security, I was concerned as anyone to see General Milley, our chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, pulled towards politics in this period of, of demonstrators in the streets. But, but I, I think uh, our military has its bearings pretty solidly uh, uh, fixed. Uh, you know, there's just the, the, the military power of the United States sometimes doesn't achieve its, its purposes, but it is still for the world a real guarantee, I think, um, against the worst outcomes. Uh, and uh, so I take some strength from that. And I think some, similarly from American intelligence, the, the efforts to politicize U.S. intelligence are ongoing, but so far, 
they don't seem really to have shaken the fundamentals of what people do every day. So, uh, Karen, I just wanted to offer those caveats in a world that looks pretty gloomy, pretty gray, where the Chinese must be saying, wow, the world's going our way. Um, it isn't going entirely their way. Thanks, David. And I want to pick up on one of the points you made, which is around global trade. But I want to put it in the frame of multilateralism being one of the issues being debated today. And a couple of our listeners have questions that relate to this theme. So we obviously have in Donald Trump, a US president who does not believe US interests have been well served by multilateral organizations. And certainly one of the organizations that take, that's taken some body blows is the World Trade Organization. The appellate body isn't functioning right now. There have been some very serious trade disputes underway. And so Cecilia, you are deeply knowledgeable about trade. And one of our listeners wanted to ask you to speak to how you see the World Trade Organization evolving. Obviously there's going to be a new leader, a new director of the WTO. Do you think the EU will put forward a European candidate? They specifically want to know what you think about the Spanish foreign minister as a possible candidate. But I want to connect <laughs> that question to the one also David raised about, do you see global supply chains staying global? Because another one of our listeners was interested in how you see the broader agenda moving forward. So Cecilia, over to you. Thank you. Arancha Gonzalez is an excellent person. I'm sure she'll do fine if she was nominated. Uh, I know that next week the trade ministers will have a meeting and they'll probably discuss the candidates and see if there is a possibility to come forward with a strong uh, name. Uh, on this. WTO is in great need of reform, modernization and strengthening and that started long before President Trump and long before the, 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 the Corona crisis and Europe has tried to reach out uh, with others, with Japan, with Canada, with Brazil, with Australia, New Zealand, etc. to try to put forward reform proposals in order to strengthen both their daily work but also new uh, rules, new new ways that it can atta uh, attack the or address rather the, the, the modern challenges such as digital trade and in certain areas we actually do work well with the US. With Japan and US we've tried to formulate new rules on, on industrial subsidies for instance and we try to push uh, on, on e-commerce where both the US and China actually are around the table uh, that we set new global rules on, on, on digital trade or e-commerce which would be very important uh, and we would desperately want the US to come back to the table to work with us on these reform to strengthen uh, the, the, the WTO. I think it is still, still up, the jury is still out a little bit on, on the, the um, value chains. Certainly there will be some regionalization, there will be some diversification, some countries have already, or some companies have already started to, to diversify, to look a little bit how to lessen their dependencies on China and Asia. I think these are judgments that are best made at the company level. Um, there are talks in Brussels and elsewhere about more autonomy, strategic autonomy, uh, regionalization, moving back strategic assets and strategic uh, value chains and so on. I think we should be a bit careful uh, about that because trade has served the European Union very well uh, and trade would be a very important uh, element in the recovery as well, not the only one, but it, it will. But there will be changes. There will be more uh, regionalization, diversification, there will be more um, calls for responsible, sustain, sustainable uh, trade, and th there might be, be some, some um, focus on some very strategic products uh, in Europe, medical products or some, some raw materials. Uh, the, the, the trick is, of course, to combine that in a way that doesn't lead to, to a new protectionist wave, because that would not be good for, for, for the recovery or for the global economy. And I hear similar trends in other countries uh, as well. So, so those of us who believe fundamentally that trade, free trade or regulated, predictable, rule-based free trade is a good thing, needs to be, uh, we need to be a bit worried right now. So David, Cecilia just spoke to one of the major pillars of the transatlantic relationship, which is the economic relationship and trade. Another significant pillar is the security relationship around NATO. And one of our listeners wanted to ask, 
what you think the implications would be of reduced defense spending in Europe. They're pointing out that we're in a major economic downturn because of the effect of the pandemic. So they're speculating that our NATO partners might actually decrease defense spending in the coming year. And do you think that that would erode the strong public support we've seen for NATO to date in this country? What do you think, David? I think that it would hurt. I think President Trump uh, has encountered a lot of resistance and his criticism of Europe and NATO, but there, but there is um, a, sh- a widely shared feeling among Democrats as well as Republicans that Europe hasn't uh, always p- paid its fair share, that uh, we're still stationing troops and weapons in Europe at great expense. Um, we're bearing this burden for our allies. So I, I think if, if Europe in this period um, uh, significantly reduced its spending, arguing we need to uh, spend money at home on recovery, that, that wouldn't sit well with the United States. And I think you'd, you'd probably see uh, reciprocal, certainly arguments for reciprocal cuts in American support for NATO programs. And then we begin a treacherous downward spiral um, in terms of security. Uh, I think, um, Karen, that we're entering an interesting period in arms control. Uh, it's it's been widely written that the Trump administration is seeking to destroy arms control agreements, and that certainly has been true in some cases. They walked away from the Open Skies Agreement and and some others, but I I take them at their word that they're trying to see if there's some way to draw China into a three way strategic arms negotiation, uh, and I think that should should interest Europe. Uh, the the argument that arms control One of the pillars of security that goes along with with our NATO world is a world in which we had had arms control agreements. Um, That's not a bilateral process anymore. The Soviet Union is gone, and we now have a China that's bidding for strategic parity with the United States. And it is kind of crazy to think about a new new START treaty that limits strategic weapons that doesn't include China. So I think that's another area where um, trying to think creatively about the future and draw our European friends into not a reflexive conversation. Let's preserve every element of the status quo. Let's let's respond to the challenges as they appear to us today. Um, but uh, you know, I, every time you think NATO is going to go away, Russia does something stupid that reanimates people's. <laughs> Uh, memories of why they why NATO is important, and I you know there's no sign that Russia is going to let up on that. Fantastic, and we're almost out of time. I'm going to ask you one last question and ask for a, a brief response from each of you. One of our listeners reminded me that in the speech that George Marshall gave at Harvard University in 1947, he also talked about the importance of quote educating the man on the street in the middle of such turbulent times. So he's saying beyond the ability of national governments to cooperate, and it would be interesting if you had an idea about how we could foster US-EU agreement at the moment, but beyond the national level, is there something we could do to help Americans broadly speaking and Europeans broadly speaking understand anew why this partnership across the Atlantic matters in their lives? So Cecilia, let me turn to you first and then we'll go to David. Well, I think educations and skills will be extremely important in in all areas uh, and this as well. So we need to know uh, our history, but we also need to know uh, our future because of that. So I think all exchange programs at university, uh, trainee programs at different uh, think tanks or or, um, institutions, uh, interns as well between companies, all that fosters a joint understanding and a friendship that that is maybe more needed than 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 ever. So I, I hope, really, really hope that that can continue and and also accelerate. David, uh, Karen, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to end with a little plug for GMF because I think that what uh, our, our questioner uh, raised is absolutely central. Um, education of the of the citizen, the citizen in the street in Europe is as well in the United States is central to what's needed right now. And organizations like GMF, if they ever wondered what purpose do they have, boy, here it is staring us right in the eyes. (laughs) Dean Atz entitled his memoirs, Present the Creation. We often think maybe we're present at 
the destruction. And it's obvious to me as we look forward that we're present at the recreation. So what are we going to recreate and how are we going to do that together? And I think for the rest of this Brussels Forum month, and, and I hope over the next years, we'll think about how we recreate institutions that are more in sync with needs, that respond to these crises, that keep us all together. So David, Cecilia, thank you so much for joining me in kicking off our first ever virtual Brussels Forum as we celebrate our 15th anniversary. And at a time that is sobering, thank you both for inspiring us and reminding us that all of us have agency in this relationship and in this world. So thank you, an enormous thanks to all of our listeners you sent in wonderful questions. I couldn't do all of them justice, but please join me in virtual applause for David and Cecilia. And I would ask you to stay on the line because we have Ambassador Deborah Burks joining us now. So David and Cecilia, thank you. Thank you, it was a pleasure. And I believe Ambassador Burks will be turning on her video in just one minute, and then we will pick up the conversation with her. Great, Karen, can you see me? <laughs> I can see you. And I am so delighted to have you with us. For those who are joining, if you are not familiar with Ambassador Deborah Burks, she is serving as the Coronavirus Response Coordinator in the White House. She also coordinates US government activities to combat HIV AIDS, and she is the US Special Representative for Global Health Diplomacy. And I just wanna start by saying a very large thank you to you for your service to my country and all you have been doing over these past months. I know how incredibly busy your schedule is and that you are taking time to join us is truly appreciated. And I want to benefit as much as we can from your knowledge. So if I could, Ambassador Burks, let me just kick off with a general question. Before I do that, I'm going to remind all of our listeners that I do want to invite you to send in questions as well. So you can use Twitter. Our Twitter handle is GMFUS. Our hashtag is Brussels Forum, or you can email questions to brusselsforum at gmfus.org. And I will do my very best to weave your questions into this conversation with Ambassador Burks. But to kick off, I would just like your assessment of how we're doing in the United States in terms of fighting COVID-19. On the one hand, tragically, 100,000 Americans have died of this virus. On the other hand, it does seem that we're having some success in flattening the curve. So Ambassador Burks, how are we doing here? Great, thank you. It's so good to see you, Karen, um, even virtually. Um, and thank you to the German Marshall Fund and the Bar Brussels Forum, who really one of the few organizations that recognize that health and economics and foreign policy and global affairs are united together. Um, many groups over the years have left out the health piece. And I think now we are really understanding how critical those interlinkages are between global health, global economics and global foreign relations. And I think domestically and globally, um, this virus has dramatically impacted the developed world upper middle income and upper income countries. Um, when you look at the proportion of people infected, you really see the, the impact and you see the impact on mortality. And I just wanna call out for a second um, my global colleagues because at the beginning of this pandemic, when everybody was terribly overwhelmed, um, it was the European ministries of health who I was able to reach out to, to really understand their on the ground experience because they were about two weeks ahead of us. In the midst of their really unrelenting um, issues, 
they constantly answered my questions. Mm -hmm. And our European health colleagues gave us the ability to understand this virus in a way that we weren't able to get from other countries at the beginning of the pandemic. And I think our European colleagues really very early on alerted us to the impact on older Americans and the issues related to comorbidities. And so when you look in the United States, our mortality has been um, better, um, but it's better because we learned early from how to really combat this at our hospital level with our hospital workers and that integrated healthcare system that we were able to bring to bear, I think really helped. I also wanna say our millennials helped because it was very important to get messages out in the United States, both to the younger generation, but to parents and grandparents, because we could see the impact on people that had three or more, what we call comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, and obesity primarily, and see the impact. And they were able to both communicate down to Generation C and up to their parents and grandparents to really get messages out how people could be protected uniquely within our need to social distance and protect one another. And I think we really, um, in the United States, obviously our mortality compared to the beginning of this pandemic is down about 50 or 60% um, in our um, daily deaths. Um, our cases are down also, but with our expanded testing, we're finding a lot, what we've been talking about since March is this huge impact of what we call asymptomatic spread. And I think that's what make this, makes this pandemic so unique is the number of individuals who have this virus who don't know they have this virus. And unknowingly, and I just wanna emphasize that, unknowingly are spreading the virus. No one is intentionally spreading the virus, but unknowingly the virus is being spread. So you can't just rely on finding the people with symptoms. And I think that's been a unique twist with this virus. It's very important as we confront this as a nation to be focused both on how we find asymptomatic individuals, as well as how we contact trace from the symptomatic individuals that are coming forward. So it's a, it's a very unique virus. I, I've been fortunate through my life to work on pandemics on the ground. Each of them are unique, but each of them have a thread that I think is critically important. And I think David Ignatius and other, and you have picked this up, the critical piece is, communi is com communicating clearly to communities. Because in the end, um, we're only as strong as our community's ability to unite together, county by county, state by state, country, to really get out the information about how to prevent the spread of this virus. Well, thanks so much. That was a great overview. And I want to draw you out on this issue of folks who are asymptomatic, because it seems to me a critical piece of trying to understand what's going to happen next. We're starting to reopen our economies and societies here in the United States at city levels, at state levels. And there's concern that we may see spikes as we start interacting more with each other. So is the recipe for success massive testing, contact tracing, and then focused isolation? And will that allow us to go back to some semblance of the life we knew before mid-March? How concerned are you about a second wave? How do you see this playing out? And again, is that trilogy of testing, contact tracing, and focused isolation the recipe for success? Well, I think that is certainly part of it. Um, and it's one part of it. And I think you know, that's classic infectious disease and public health. You find the person that presents um, you find all of their contacts, you diagnose the person that presents, you isolate them, you isolate their contacts, you get everyone tested and their second generation and third generation contacts to prevent the spread. I think in the case of this virus, we have to do that, but we also have to do what we call proactive surveillance. And what do I mean by that? I think in the Opening Up America guidelines, we were very clear about the importance for people that have pre these pre-existing conditions to continue to shelter. Because we knew with opening up, 
we would have individual potential increased cases and we wanted to protect those individuals that were most likely to what we call develop disease or develop severe disease. And so far, it looks like people have been really attentive to that. You see people wearing masks, you see people social distancing, and you see people really protecting the most vulnerable. And that will need to continue both in the workplace and within family units. I think the piece about finding asymptomatics really means that you have to do this proactive monitoring. And so it's not just about having lots of tests because we have lots of tests now and we have lots of different testing platforms. It's really about how you strategically use those tests to test the right people. And so right now um, we've recommended um, really focusing on where is the most likely issue related to high levels of what we call rapid spreading events or rapid spreading conditions. We know one of our most vulnerable groups has been nursing homes. And this is not only true in the nurse in United States, but throughout our European colleague countries. Um, and we know what happens is our, the workers, again, who don't know they're infected, bring the virus into the nursing homes and it spreads easily from patient to patient in that kind of communal living environment. So any place you have communal living, we're suggesting that people really go in there state by state, county by county and proactively test. And so the vice president on a governor's call, and I really called out for every governor to really make sure 100% of nursing home residents and workers are tested. And then, then there's routine screening of workers. That needs to happen in prisons. That needs to happen in any workplace where people live together. So when we talk about in the United States, when we talk about these plants, these meatpacking plants where there is significant spread, a lot of that spread may be happening outside of the plant. It may happen in communal transport to the plant or communal living um, outside of the plant. And so anytime we have multiple people living and eating together, it seems a greater opportunity for spread, again, among an individual who is asymptomatic. And I think that's what makes this uniquely different. When people get sick and have a high fever, like happens with this disease, they're not out and about because they feel terrible. Um, and so when you have the flu, you stay home in bed. When you have COVID-19 and you're sick, you stay home in bed. When you're asymptomatic and you're out, you're out a month. And so when you look at the cities that have had the most difficult time with this, it's cities that really rely on mass transport. So really getting that right any kind of density where there's people that have to transport together or live together. Multi-generational households are particularly at risk. It's a risk in my household. So I don't see my daughter who's caring for her young, two young children and my parents, because she's got a 91 and a 96 year old plus a one year old and a two year old. So she's in both areas of the spectrum. Um, and she's quarantined and everything goes to them without, with social distancing to protect them. And I think a lot of families are gonna to have to work at how they can protect one another in all of this. We got through Memorial Day weekend without a significant rate increase in spike of cases. I do worry, I worry terribly about the peaceful protest. I see some wearing masks, I see some others not wearing masks. And so we are really trying to work with each of the mayors to expand testing availability over the next week or two so that the individuals who are involved in the peaceful protests can get tested and really know their status before they unknowingly spread it to um, the elderly. And then finally, I want to end with, there's a lot we don't still know about the virus. And this communal sharing around the United States and around the world about information um, that we see, we do see some young people with rocky courses. And now we see these pediatric cases that went out as a CDC alert. Um, again, it looks like some of that is related to how you respond to the virus, what kind of antibody you make and how quickly you make it and, and what that triggers in your own body. So there's still things we have to learn about the virus. And then we still have to learn about how our immune response looks to that virus. But we learn every day and the sharing globally of information and the ability of people to publish before everything is peer reviewed has been extraordinarily helpful.
Mm -hmm. There are so many interesting things you said that I want to follow up on. One of them is we do see the virus affecting people differently. And one of the tragic things we've seen is that COVID-19 is having a disproportionate impact on communities of color in the U.S. We're seeing that in Europe as well. And I'm wondering if you can help us understand what explains that and what we can do about it. I think two things are really important about that. And, and right now we're seeing the same thing in the United States among our Hispanic communities. Um, we're seeing over the last two to three weeks in Arkansas, in Utah, in Milwaukee, um, really expansion, and even in the district, Washington, D.C., in areas where there are large number of Hispanic households. So what uniquely puts individuals at risk? One, being an essential worker. So when we talk about um, the United States being shut down, I think all Americans recognize that that was probably only 50 or 60% of the population. 40 to 50% of the population continued to work. They're the ones that continued to get groceries on the shelves and working in the farms and working in processing plants. And they're the ones that kept food on their tables. They're the ones who drove the trucks. They're the ones that did the deliveries. They're the ones that went to the hospitals um, and went to really care for those who needed us the most. And so there was a large segment of the American population still working. And a lot of that was in our African-American and Hispanic communities. And so uniquely, they were working more in those essential jobs. Secondly, they often are in metro areas. And in the United States, the metros were hit more seriously than the rural areas just due to the density of the population. Many of them have to use public transportation. So the things that I talked about, public transportation, and finally, multi-generational living um, and multi-generational care groups. And then finally, issues related to comorbidities and really understanding those comorbidities. And so when you line up all of those pieces, you begin to see that level of vulnerability. And I just, there's also, there, so there's that vulnerability, but there's also still the vulnerability among the aged. And I think these are the two pieces we need to constantly be communicating about. And then our Native Americans also, same level of issues with multi-generational households, oftentimes without full ability of complete ability to address um, obesity or comorbidities and limited health care and limited health care access at times. So we've really um, worked at the federal government of pushing out supplies to both all of these three areas, to nursing homes, to the hospitals, uh, and to the, our Native American communities. Because once you could see, and again, a lot of this vulnerability came from our European colleagues early on. And I, I just can't tell you how grateful I was. These are individuals I've known for a long time. And I know how overwhelming it can be when you're working for your prime minister and your president, and you're trying to get all of this stuff done. And then you have Debbie Burke saying, what are you seeing? <laughs> you know, they're coming back and really informing us about what they're finding worked and didn't work. And I think in the end, when the United States sees its mortality compared to Europe, we should be very grateful to our European colleagues and to our American innovation and hospital structure that saved so many people's lives. But that's why this kind of transparency is important. And I think if we had known the level of asymptomatic spread, both in Europe and in the United States, it would have changed policy. And I think not knowing that until it get, hits your borders is a very difficult thing. And I think we really learned that that level of over communicating and that moral obligation you have to over communicate in the time of a pandemic really becomes critical because these little nuances that may not seem important because they're not arriving at your hospital door become equally important when you're trying to stop a rapidly spreading pandemic. Well, and I love the fact that you've been referring to the cooperation with your European colleagues. And we have a couple of our listeners who wanted me to draw you out on that. And they've noted that 
across Europe, we have different examples of dealing with the pandemic. You have a case like Sweden, where they didn't put in place a so-called lockdown, and they've had a high death rate, but they're now reporting zero new cases. And arguably, they have a higher immunity now in their population. But you have other countries that have pursued very similar policies. I mean, Denmark, for example, did put in place a lockdown. They're now opening back up. But the Danes have not encouraged their citizens to wear masks. And the Danes, there's a quote here saying, the Danes believe it gives people a false sense of security to wear masks. So could you talk a little bit about these different models, what you've learned from them, and why it's led you to land in the place where you've landed? Yeah, thank you. I think, you know, we landed on the mass issue because of the physics behind it. So, I mean, we really did start with the recommendation of social distancing, and we made it clear about the social distancing. But then a group, um, starting with MIT, really studied particles. And um, when you start to see that talking moves viral particles, if you're infected, a number of feet, let alone sneezing and coughing. I think it was the talking piece and the, and the singing piece that I think alerted us that um, when you can't socially distance, you should have a mask on. And I think we've been very clear about that. I think each, this is our first experience with this particular virus as a pandemic. I think the experience with SARS, which we all know about, and MERS, which we know about, which were prior coronavirus pandemics, their spread was so limited. I think that people were originally were like, this is a coronavirus, starts in Asia or starts in a few countries and doesn't spread globally. And so there was that shared experience with prior coronavirus. I think when this went so rapidly, and now we know that it went that rapidly because opposed to SARS and MERS, they didn't have this level of asymptomatic and asymptomatic spread. And so, yes, it will change our case fatality rates, but it's not going to change the fact that this virus is highly contagious. And so I think those kinds of pieces and each, and then learning from each of the European countries and frankly, learning from each of our states, although we put out federal guidelines and those are our best recommendations based on the science, each governor and frankly, each mayor does things a little bit differently. And so we'll have experience across the United States and everybody, what I have learned over the last three months is everybody is doing the absolute best they can. Um, no matter where you live in the world, every government is taking this seriously and everybody is doing the best they can to confront this and learning as they go. When you think that three months ago, I think Italy had 50 cases. The United States maybe had 10 um, that we knew about. Um, the, the dramatic learning in 90 days has become possible because of learning from each other, but also giving, not being so strict that say you have to do it this way because not we don't have all the information. So we have to be sensitive and not overly critical of one another when people choose different pathways. I think the Sweden case will be important because I think what they will find and what we're finding across the United States, even when you have a pretty significant outbreak like you have in the New York metro area, because they closed a little bit later than um, the federal guidelines and the virus did spread pretty dramatically. Even in that case with significant spread and the largest number of cases in the United States um, per population, they don't have high, they don't have 60%, 70% of their population that has gotten infected. It's more about 22%. And I think Sweden is finding the same thing. So none of us can be lulled into this false sense of security that the cases may go down over the summer. Collectively, as a global community and certainly within the United States, we're preparing very actively for a potential that we will have cases that we have to find quickly in the fall um, and really find each of those outbreaks and stop them. Europe needs to be preparing exactly the same way because no country, no matter what approach that they have taken, 
have resulted in enough immunity to protect their population if the virus comes back in the fall. Mm -hmm. And so what you mean by that is when, it sounds like when there's a second wave, it will be inevitable, we would need to move back into a lockdown scenario? No, what we're saying is we want to be able, with a combination of what we talked about, this contact tracing and proactive surveillance, that we will find cases before we allow the virus to spread. And so that you're doing containment and mitigation county by county and community by community rather than country by country. And I think that will change things dramatically. We now across the United States, um, and it often doesn't get talked about because we focus very much on our metros, but our smaller metros, places like Kansas City and Des Moines, when they've had an outbreak, they've been able to contact trace, proactively monitor and be able to contain the virus. So we have examples, even in the midst of this pandemic, of really proactive public health and really seeing that this can be done. That gives us the assurance that that can be done in the fall if the virus comes back in a way that we have to really bring all of our forces to bear, which we're ready for, as well as really the mandate from the president to work on therapeutics and vaccines to really make sure that we have ability to both treat and prevent severe disease in American citizens. Super, thank you for clarifying that. And I wanna draw you out on the potential for global cooperation. You spoke about the importance of the interactions with your European colleagues. Do you feel that the right basis for that international cooperation are bilateral relationships? I know the administration feels that the World Health Organization is, is not the right organization to manage global cooperation. And you've had such a great front row seat on this in the context of HIV AIDS, where we've had the US president's emergency plan for AIDS relief PEPFAR, which has been deeply committed to continuing global progress toward controlling the HIV epidemic. So is there a response or an initiative that might be similar to PEPFAR that would work globally on the coronavirus pandemic? Or what do you think is the right framework for that global cooperation? I, I thank you, Karen, for bringing this up because every year um, we'll lose 1.5 to 1.7 million people this year to HIV and TB. And there is still incredible need to stop those, those pandemics of HIV, TB, and malaria. And the United States is a strong supporter of both the Global Fund and Gavi, which are multilateral organizations focused on those diseases. I think though, this has been a real wake up call for the developed world to really find an organization that can work together in a like-minded way. And what do I mean by that? I think the level of stress on the supply chain to the developed world was equal, if not greater to the stress that I have experienced in resource limited settings. And the things that we ran out of or came close to running out of, it, it was shocking to me as a global community. And I think you talked earlier, I think with David about what we will need in redundancy in manufacturing and supply chain. And I think that is something that needs to be done this summer. We cannot go into another potential threat situation without diversification in the supply chain. I think we, we were lulled into a sense that we had what we needed. And I think when you go from, when you go from last year, we were utilizing less than 3 million of what we call these I-95 masks, 3 million per month. We went to a place where we were utilizing a log or more greater than that. Um, and so our supply chains were not made for that kind of dramatic surge and they weren't anywhere in the world. And I think it really speaks to how we need to diversify our supply chain in a real way. And I think that will take like-minded individuals working together both to stop pandemics around the globe in resource limited settings, but ensure that in 
the developed world, there are robust supply chains to really meet the needs of the citizens. And I, I really want to, again, really show that is really critical. I know right now the United States is providing ventilators around the world. Um, to countries that needed more. Um, and I've been really proud to watch that happen, to really open up our factories to make ventilators. And those ventilators now are going um, to upper middle income and upper income countries as well as resource limited settings. And that's what's possible when we work together in a proactive way. And I think that's what I think we really need to ensure we develop through the fall. These pandemic plans that we, these tabletop activities that we've spent a lifetime working on did not really call attention to the fact that when you have a pandemic, the most important thing for testing may be nasal swabs. And sometimes it comes down to that most simple thing that can be rate limiting. And I think we have a much better idea. In fact, we have a deep idea of what it's gonna take um, for future respiratory pandemics um, that we really didn't have in the complete plans before. And so it's always, and we always say that in the military that you know, plans are great until first encounter. Um, our plans were great until this encounter with a virus and the reality of it. And I think finding individuals who want to work together across the global community to really ensure that there's robust um, diversification in our supply chains. And it's each doing our part to support one another. So each country among our allies has what they need. And I know you have to go, I'm gonna ask you one final question, which is of interest to everybody listening. And it's uh, one of the folks listening right in saying, the foundation of transatlantic relations is people to people communication and connection. When are we gonna be able to fly across the Atlantic again? And is it when our temperature is taken at the airport? Is it when we have certificates that we have confirmed antibodies? Or do we need to wait until there's either an effective treatment regime or an effective vaccine. So when can people fly again? Okay, well, really great question. It gives me the, the two, the, you know, I think many of you know I trained as a clinical immunologist. So it gives me one second on antibody and antibody tests. So um, the reason people, it's been all, but it's difficult for the American people and people around the globe to understand this immunity question is there's several different kinds of antibodies made when you're confronted with this virus. And one of them that we make is what we call to the nuclear proteins. Those are inside the virus itself. And so those aren't neutralizing. They don't protect that you from getting that virus going from cell to cell. But then there's antibody to what we call the spike protein. And that's the outside coating. That's the protein that binds into your nasal epithelium or into your lungs. And actually remember this virus has to go into your cell and use your cell machinery to replicate itself. And so neutralizing the antibody protects, protects you so that the virus can't go into your cells. That's a simple way of putting it. And so some of the assays measure the nuclear protein and some of them measure the spike protein. So when we talk about immunity, we really need to make sure that the assay is measuring the spike protein. The other one will tell you you've been infected. The other one tells you you may have immune response that will keep you from getting this again. And so it's the airlines. I've been very impressed about what the airlines are doing um, to protect each and every one of both their customers and their, and their flight crew. It's really key though, that if we're gonna as a global community fly again before um, we have ability of a vaccine, that we really adhere to strict personal hygiene and strict regulations related to mask use. Because again, if you're on the plane, remember it's length of time that you've been next to somebody <laughs> and social distance. And if you can't social distance, you really need to wear a mask. And so, this will be really important that global communities decide that they wanna be out and about again. We are finding that, you know, three to five to 10% of Americans in certain situations may have antibodies, same way with the Europeans, I'm sure the same way in other parts of the world. Companies may have to decide that those are your forward leading people that are out and about and traveling extensively. But people really have learned to do Zoom. I'll be interested to see how 
um, how this works because I've been to uh, several Brussels forums. I love the dialogue, the dialogue that not only happens in the room, but the dialogue that happens outside of the room. I think that's what we're gonna be missing is that ability to pick people's brains over coffee. And I think that's such a critical point. Um, I'm hoping that the global community as it sprints to a vaccine will have something sooner rather than later. And I just wanna make one last comment about vaccines because it's important like antibody. There are vaccines that cause what we call sterilizing immunity. That means if you've had that vaccine, you can't get infected. And there are vaccines that present, prevent disease. That means you get infected but you don't have serious disease. So those are two different kinds of vaccines. It's easier, just to be clear to all of your listeners, to make a vaccine that prevents disease. Um, that means that you still may get a mild case. That means you still may be able to transmit the virus to others. And that will be really important then that you do large immunizations, um, but really start with the individuals most likely to get disease. And that allows us to really prioritize because we talked about, we know now who's most vulnerable. We know who's most vulnerable to disease and making sure that they are first on the vaccine list to really become protected first so that they don't get disease. It's kind of like what Sweden was thinking, but with a vaccine, but you prevent, you prevent the mortality. And so you, the people who can, um, get infected and be asymptomatic could potentially have those infections, but you're really protecting anybody who has significant comorbidities. And I will just end with a round the globe. This is a real call to action for all of us to improve our health. Um, we've talked about it a lot, um, but really ensuring your diabetes is controlled. And for those of you around the world that have type two diabetes and you're a little bit overweight, really addressing the overweight issue will be really important for your health. It's really been clear how this virus really preys on people who have some level of being overweight. And so I, I hope it's a call to action for all of us to take our health more seriously. And so as the sun comes up and the humidity goes up and we can be out in social distance, being outside and being um, healthy again, I think will be really important for not only the American people, but people around the globe. I can't think of a better note to end on. A thousand thanks to you for helping us kick off our 15th Brussels Forum. And more importantly, a thousand thanks for everything you are doing for all of us in terms of trying to be healthier and combat this pandemic. Wishing you the very, very best. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.